When I do competitive research or I do a deep dive to trace out relationships between organizations, it's not that I know more. It's just I know how to find information. Hi, I'm Justin Hitt with Inside Strategic Relations. Knowing how to find primary source information and resources, kind of to be an information detective, is extremely useful to uh, trace out beneficial relationships, to be aware of laws, rules, and regulations, to kind of stay ahead of changes in, in your marketplace, to find new investment opportunities, and to ultimately Stay one step ahead of your competition. Now, how do I do this? Well, first off, what I do is research using public information and research services. So I don't go out and go to the library in a town. I might hire somebody to go to a library to pull records. I might uh, have a subscription to a database service where I can do a deep dive inside of data. I might pull a public source and then um, go through that public source to see what we can find. Um, I, I don't ha I don't like to have detectives out in the field doing anything. I'm not hiring private investigators unless that's something that may be necessary for the client. But ultimately, what I'm doing is I'm gathering information, validating that information because it's easy to find what you're looking for. It's difficult to find those hidden relationships. So I validate what's going on, making sure there's no bias, making sure there's no uh, slant in the story, uh, and then ultimately I compile that information into a usable report. So that's what I'm going to share with you today, kind of the importance of this, some of the mistakes that you can make, and then ultimately uh, open the door to the concept that there are people out there that look into things for people, uh, especially writing competitive reports for competitive analysis. They might write a report for how to approach a certain law or a change in the regulatory environment. They may even write a report for a an institution that is then going to repackage that port report and use it in their marketing. So the first thing you want to make sure that you're doing is that you're not injecting any of your own opinion in this. I have done research on topics where I had no interest. I had no uh, position on the topic. I didn't care one way or the other. And that's really the best way to approach a project because your job as a researcher or somebody who's going to find the facts is to only find the facts. In fact, you need to... <laughs> You need to know when you look at something, whether it's been biased or it has language that leans one side or another uh, or or tries to inject some hidden aspect. In fact, I was doing one research assignment for a client and we noticed that a lot of the public media coverage all traced back to a uh, a phrase that was in a press release. So the press release comes out year one. And so we're, we, sometimes you'll put things on a timeline to get an idea of how things laid out. So the press release came out year, year one. Six months after the press release came out, there started to be light media coverage in small local markets. And they were almost word for word the press release. Then there was a change in the marketplace. And the larger publications, probably about the end of the year, started coming out with more and more coverage on this particular item. But it all traced back to the press release. So the press release was generated by the company, the subject of interest, and the subject of interest can say anything they want about themselves, right? So that led to looking for secondary sources. So we wanted to look for, did they have any uh, securities exchange filings? Did they have any uh, regulatory related reports? Um, did an independent group review the company and have findings? What about this company made that thing spread? other than the marketing. And what we, we came to notice is that they had a really good media group and there was the same media group as a political group, political committee, and the political committee or the political individuals were on a committee that didn't call this company for a problem that was happening in their industry. So we found a what's called a relationship loop. Uh, so two individuals using the same public relations company. One of those individuals was in a position to uh, narrow the list down on an inquiry, a selection in the future. And so even though the company had announced something similar to the problem that came up later and was referenced in the conversation associated with the, um, the problem that came up later, they didn't get called in front of Congress. And so they kind of um, the you know they kind of were able to stay clear 
of the larger picture. Well, that's not a company you want to invest in. Yeah, they got connections in high places, but they're doing things that are wrong. Now, later they ended up getting in trouble because the political person fell out of favor. Uh, But ultimately, this kind of research is identifying threads, laying those threads out, validating them. Do we have evidence for this claim? Do we have a a timeline that demonstrates uh, resources were put into this to make it happen? Or was it something that happened naturally? Were there conditions in the marketplace that made this a perfect time for such and such to happen? Uh, A more easy report to explain would be one that you're getting ready to launch a product and you're interested in knowing what other competitors are saying in their advertising about the same type of product. This is very important because if you're going to launch something and you find out what your competitors are saying, you might as well also find out what do the people say against the competitor's product. So I'll give you a book example. You can go to Amazon and see the best reviews and you can see the worst reviews. If you're going to release a similar book, you might want to counter the criticism of your competitors. That way you don't have to bring it up about your own product. You can basically say what you need to say. Well, that works with larger product as well. And you can get that criticism out of uh, you know social media sentiment. You can get it out of, out of research by looking at message boards. And it works for book-sized products and even equipment-sized products or computer-sized products. But again, it's all research that has been critically reviewed in order to make a better decision. Now, I have a process for this, which we don't have time to go into today, but the process essentially starts with some kind of scope of work. Now, many times you're going to want an outcome as a result of the research. Now, the outcome is best if it's a better decision. You don't want the you don't want to research to discover someone's guilty of something. It just doesn't it, it biases your approach. But you don't want something so generic that you go down a rabbit hole with research that never produces anything. So a lot of times what I like to do is I'll come up with a scope of work. What are the things that we need to know? And that scope of work is about things we need to know to make a decision. Some clients have very clear frameworks for this because they're doing uh, like risk management uh, in a specific industry. But ultimately... You approach the job with as narrow scope as possible and then deliver some kind of draft report. Now, the draft report may not have an opinion in it. It may just be, here are the facts. Do we all agree that these are the facts? A lot of the research that I do, I work on teams, and teams might have different subject matter experts on it, on them. So I may provide engineering-related research to the engineers, financial research to the financial people, and then leadership-related research to the leaders. And then once everybody's feedback is in, then I might go get additional information to answer questions that may have come up. And then all of these materials may be compiled back into a single report that's then provided to the client uh, to satisfy the original scope of work. If if, if it's enough information for them to take the next step, because I don't always know why they're using this information or what they're using it for, Um, But ultimately, if it's enough to take the next step, they go off and take the next step. If not, we develop a new scope of work. Now, you may have seen in my office uh, or some of the pictures all these binders. Well, sometimes I'm engaged to develop a process for something. And so if I'm going to develop a process to solve a problem, we can start with what's called user stories. Those user stories describe the outcome that the user of this process seeks to achieve. And those user stories then help me frame whether I should be looking at best practices in a trade association, whether I should look at uh, particular publications. Actually, I'm reaching across my desk right here. I've got a book in front of me called Risk Analysis and Security Countermeasures Selection. Well, it's full of case studies of different types of uh, risk situations. And sometimes I might find a model that's similar to to the client's unique situation. And so we might, we might model out something that's, that exists. We can look at past performance. How did we solve this problem in the past? And then I would write up the highest level of the process. We would identify what risks are associated with the process. We would identify if there are any laws, rules, regulations, policies that 
uh, would frame the process. And then ultimately from a draft, we would then go into our swim lanes, our um, the uh, risk matrices, the roles and responsibilities, a uh, SIPOC, which is kind of like a, a, a mapping of the deliverables. Um, but without getting too complex into the weeds, into the weeds, the key of what I'm saying right now is that while there's a lot of information available, without a consistent approach, without the ability to suspend your belief system, to basically set aside all your biases, to set aside all of your concepts about what you're doing and to work within a specific scope, well, you could do a lot of research and not have any results. And I think what's on my plate right now, I'm writing a special report about how the how raising taxes, and this is 2021, a lot of talk about raising taxes. I'm doing a, a quick special report for a client about how raising taxes actually increase costs for the poor. Now, this report is going to be used in as the basis of fundraising letters. So I'm doing research. They're going to take this research and they're going to write fundraising letters to try to uh, support advocacy against raising taxes or, or at least a more equitable tax system that doesn't claim to tax the wealthy and actually cost the poor. And so that was even kind of a nutshell of the, the scope of work, the uh, hypothesis or the thesis of the activity that we want to approach. Now, I've got to go in my mind and say, well, the client's claiming that ta- taxing the rich actually hurts the poor. I have to research both that statement as well as how taxing the rich helps the poor. And then variable, you can build a matrices out of this, but uh, the variable of taxing the poor. What if we, we tax everybody the same rate? And then you can build from that, gather your information, build out your drafts, present it to the to the client. Now, sometimes you're going to write a report that, that is very biased on purpose. They want to they want to know something specific, but when you're doing research yourself to make decisions, you really got to do like the example here and suspend your position. Uh, let's look at it four or five different ways. Gather the information together. Cluster the information around key topic areas, key benefits, key mistakes, key areas, and then deliver it. So. For every process I've ever written for a client, I actually keep a binder. And many of these processes I've used as consultant, actually helping to implement these processes. I don't, I don't create processes that I haven't done something with in the in the past. Um, but these binders then become resources that now I can have a better starting place. I can be, use my own organized research to start that next level. That's what gives me subject matter credibility in these particular areas. So this is a very important skill, being able to research difficult and complex topics. A a relationship trace between companies could be a deep dive through seven or eight layers of publicly traded companies and private companies and vendor relationships. Um, Looking at new laws, rules, and regulations could be hundreds of pages of just, you know, oh my gosh, dribble, drivel on these um the way some of these laws are written. But my point being is having these critical thinking skills helps you make better decisions in your finances, helps you make better decisions like for due diligence before you get into a role at a company. It may even help you be in a position where you're more valuable to your company because you know the history or the background of a situation that they face in the marketplace. No matter what it is, this is a skill that f- supports, it feeds, it backstops your relationships to make you more valuable. I'm Justin Hitt with Inside Strategic Relations, and this is an application of critical thinking to do research and to produce a deliverable, which is a report that can ultimately help make better decisions. You've made a great decision to listen to this podcast. I'm here to help high-income professionals and entrepreneurs uh, transform business relationships and the profits. If you have any questions about what I've covered here or in any other program, visit me at www.insidestrategicrelations.com and ask your question. Simply go to the contact page and then send in your question in a written form. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions in future podcasts, articles, or may even write a special report to answer your questions. 
Again, thanks for listening. I'm Justin Hitt with Inside Strategic Relations.